I'm going to try and be standing up, even though I've, uh, some of you know I've been quite unwell for three weeks, what with the eye infection, but I think I can just about see my Bible. <laughs> uh, yes, so we're going to, if I may say some things this morning, and, uh, and uh, afterwards, uh, if it's affected you, um, then maybe we'll pray for you um, after this session and then we'll do all the sessions as well so I just want to explain to you about me some of you only know me as a, a pastor of uh, this church and a min- somebody who ministers in miracles and uh, deliverance which I've been doing for 30 odd years but basically I just want to explain a little bit about myself and, uh, and where I'm coming from and uh, my testimony some of you know some, but some of you don't know any. And Ian asked about uh, uh, what job do you do? And I used to be a builder. And when I became a Christian, I realized that I could not stay in that building business any longer because a lot of things that we weren't correctly right with the word of God, you know, you do things which are um, unbranded and things like that and I thought so well I can't deal with that at all so I left that business and then I started another business and uh, and um, basically uh, um, I was doing that and uh, we, we tried together and we seemed to do all right together doing a nursery and um, we spent most of the money we got and uh, after a legacy on um, all on greenhouses and um, but and that failed as well and uh, but I had to finish that business because the accountant said to me that David you defrauding the government so that fell as well <laughs> the reason I defrauding the government because I was making money out of the VAT and you know you can understand that you can be registered for VAT as low as you want but uh, not as high as you want but you can lower it as low as you want and there's a possibility of running it but making money so they give you money rather than you pay them money and you're meant to be paying them money you're supposed to be a tax collector so I was getting money from from uh, uh, the VAT all the while and the accountant said to me uh, we've got to stop you doing that business David because you're defrauding the government and I should get in trouble as well so that had to fail as well so we lost on that then and then uh, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do because I've now gone bankrupt in two businesses when I left my first business as a builder, the Lord told me to give whatever I got was to give the money away. We didn't get much money out of it, but he said a lot of it was uh, uh, called dirty money. So I don't want dirty money. So the Lord told me to give it away. And I thought, well, I can give it back. I told all these people, what can I do? So the Lord said, just give it to some organization and uh, just get it out of your hands give it so I gave it and, and nearly we came out of that business where it was about £9,000 and nearly most of it all was given away and I was so happy when that organisation went bankrupt <laughs> so somehow it went back to the government didn't it somewhere along the line but it, come out of, it came out from me because I was reading Zacchaeus where he says uh, give away four times as much give back to the people and what you've got pay back four times as much and then then he said to Zacchaeus you uh, uh, salvation has come to your house and really all I really wanted to do was to serve Jesus most of you know me just as a, a miracle worker and some people just want me to produce miracles I've been to churches and they all they want me to do is show us a miracle, do us a miracle. Well, I can't do that. And I'm not going to do that. Because the fact of it is that uh, Jesus is the miracle worker 
and I'm just a servant. So anyway, uh, uh, I, I got to understand about Jesus and my mum said to me when I was a little boy, she said, David, you've got to learn to love God with all of your heart. And that's what I really wanted to do. And uh, even though I'd failed him in every, lots of areas, and, but I still really wanted to love God with my heart. But I thought I was trying to put things right. So then I learned about the Holy Spirit. And, you know, uh, people could minister healing and deliverance and do so many things. When Jesus was around, he told the disciples to go and do this. But the anointing was there with Jesus. And they were riding on the back of Jesus in when he said disciples go out. But when Jesus had gone to heaven, and then he said, stay in Jerusalem because you can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. So they had to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit came with the initial speaking in tongues, which is a sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So uh, that's what, uh, they told me in the, in the Methodist Church that that's what I needed to do. And I didn't understand it at all. And I said, well, I just said, look, whatever it costs, I don't care what happens in my life. I don't care what. It happens to me. I don't care about nothing. As long as he'll baptise me in his Holy Spirit. And then after counselling, I found out that uh, I didn't receive anything because when I was a little boy, I also was watching a television programme and uh, it was an hypnotist on the television and it, it affected my life. And uh, therefore, uh, I felt a demon coming to me uh, through the television programme as a little boy. And uh, it left me with uh, a problem with um, not sleeping properly and... Uh, uh, hearing voices and so many things but it started much further back than that because uh, when I was three my mum told me to kiss my grandma who was dead and I, I was stiff people do that and maybe some of you have done that or touch dead bodies and you see what actually happens the spirit from that person into you and so therefore whatever you've got if that, uh, if that person had this problem then you've got the problem and uh, that's why the Bible's all against it if you read in Numbers and Deuteronomy you should not touch your kiss a dead body and so that was what affected my life and uh, really it was uh, a bad thing and I didn't realise how after uh, how um, a man came for prayer and, and he um, shared with me he got asthma and I said, how long you had asthma? And he said, I've had it uh, 50 years. I said, how, how old are you? He said, I'm 53. So I said, well, what happened when you were three? Because you hadn't got it before, so what happened when you were three? He said, well, you had to think. And I, he said, well, all I can know is that uh, I kissed my grandma when she died. I said, what did your grandma die of? He said, asthma. I said, there you are, you see, spirit come from your grandma into you, now you've got it. And anybody knows if they're looking around a dead body and something like that, uh, they, they can see it sometime before the dying or before the dying, the eyes are flashing all, all over the place, just waiting to go into somebody else. And uh, that's why you have to be careful. And I know uh, that that does happen. And I'm going to be talking about, more about this in a few moments. Well, so this really happened to me and they the, the prayed with me and uh, the power of God came upon me. And uh, this, I, like I said, I gave me money away, I got everything away, I wanted to dump everything because I wanted the Holy Spirit. And uh, sometimes people want the Holy Spirit but they're not willing to give anything up. <laughs> sometimes you've got to give everything up in your life, whatever it is. And uh, so this has happened to me, and this is where I was. And uh, that night, the Lord baptised me in his Holy Spirit, and Helen wondered what was happening. But uh, I had a series of visions through the night, and uh, I don't remember them now, but they're so wonderful. Uh, the first vision I had was at uh, the Star of Bethlehem. And I saw this great star coming down to the, 
and I was speaking in tongues towards this star and it was so real I was in the vision there and then the next vision I saw was um, just beautiful flowers all different colours and shapes better colours than you've ever seen and the Lord was just showing me there that in heaven there'll be all sizes, all shapes, all colours and all everything in heaven there'll be all sorts who really love Jesus and then the next one I saw was a tomb and I was running to this garden tomb and uh, the tomb was on my left hand side and if anybody's been to Jerusalem to the garden tomb they'll see exactly what I've seen because when I went to Jerusalem I said this is my vision I saw this is where he rose from the dead this is the vision that I saw and I didn't see that vision but I saw it then and then the next one was uh, uh, I felt a lot of power come into my fingers. I didn't know what it was. I said to my wife, what's, what's happened to my fingers? And uh, it was all through the night there. So I said, what's happened to my fingers? She, my fingers are blowing up. She said, no, they're not. They're all right. And I never read the scripture where it says, if we remove evil spirits by the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven shall come upon you. And uh, I didn't know what God was doing there, but I can see now he was calling me into deliverance ministry. I didn't want to do that. And then I saw a vision of Jesus. He was in a cloud, and I actually saw him. And uh, um, I was speaking and singing in his vision. And then I saw another vision, I couldn't quite get to it, but I just wanted to see it. I just couldn't get there, I just couldn't get there. And it was a light, a great light. And, uh, and a pastor, a Pentecostal pastor a few years ago said to me, David, that was the light of God, but you won't see that until you die. But you wanted to see it, but he showed me that it is there. And then the last vision that came to me and uh, I, um, I asked it to go away. I couldn't cope with it. I just couldn't cope with it. I can't cope with it. I can't cope with it. And so next day I went to talk to the, the pastor of the Methodist Church. It was happening and I told him, well, more this, I said about this vision, it came back and it landed straight upon my head. And the vision was all the stars of the universe were on my head and they flung out into the sky all the stars of the universe and they were all coming back to my head and uh, the minister didn't know he didn't thought I'd gone crazy or something but this was so real to me and this vision was so real and I want to tell you I know healing I never asked God to give me the gift of deliverance. All I wanted to do was to love Jesus and to serve him. So most of you know me just as a deliverance, a healing minister. But you know, it was happening before, while this was happening, we got one daughter, Haley, which we loved, and we struggled to get Haley, but God blessed us, didn't he? And uh, the Lord said to me, that uh, you want to serve me, uh, well, do what Abraham did then, go and kill your child. So, I didn't, and uh, there was a point that I was just about to kill my wife and my child, and the Lord intervened, and, and I thought, this kid, no, it's crazy, I, I can't deal with this. So they took me to the doctors, and I said, I'm crazy, I'm crazy. And I didn't, obviously that was a devil, but I didn't realize that. But the fact of it is, I thought, if, is that what I've got to do to prove I love God? To prove I love God, because I went to give up everything. So I could have God. And, uh, but God's sorted me out and put me right. And here I am today. And here I am, ministered all over the world and seen all sorts of miracles and everything. So I'll just let you know, I am not just a, a deliverance minister, and I'm not just think that I'm, a, um, if, we, if we concentrate on this church, it concentrates only on deliverance and things like that. The Lord say you're building a, something which is an abomination to me, because there's more aspects to the ministry of Jesus than healing and deliverance. 
there's all sorts of ministers. Even though I'm ministering this, right? Even though God blessed me in this, what really my heart is to really to love God and to serve God. Now, I've not shared all this with everybody, but you've got it today. It's because I've had some time to think while I've been away and to think about what am I doing and uh, what am I doing with my life and what am I doing with what God has blessed me with. I mean, I don't know how long I shall be pastor of this church. I do not know. But the fact of it is I shall always want to serve God. And uh, just sharing this with you that uh, um, my, uh, all my vision is in life was to love Jesus. So uh, that's what I'm going to bring my message now. But I want to share that with you. So you know a little bit about David. You know my inner being, you know what I'm about, and uh, what you see is what you get. Okay? God bless you. <laughs> I'm going to do my teaching now. To be. Is Richard gone? He talked from today. Let's have a look if it was. Transfers to spirits. Here we are. Transference of spirits, well, a lot of people don't know, understand this. But I understand it and everything I teach on, I understand. And a lot of it I can teach to experience and, uh, and uh, whatever I've been through and that. And I want to say that the people in this church that are here, they, can, they, could, they should be all be able to teach this message and all my teachings because they've had them for years. So uh, they should all be able to do it as well as me uh, as they've had it all. And uh, you've got it today. So there's no excuse if you don't take it in and understand. Because you're here to want to know, you're here to understand. And uh, the thing is that uh, um, we're talking about transference of spirits. So in Psalm 144, can you read that over Can you see it all right here? Is that the same one? I can't quite see it. Oh yeah, it's the same as mine out here. Stretch out your hand from above, rescue me and deliver me out of great waters, from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speak lying words, and whose right hand is the right hand of falsehood. So you can see to the laying on of hands, there's good and bad. There's evil as well. And you've got to be careful laying on the hands. Now, some of you may come up to me and say, well, you've been here, David, and can I pray for you? And I'm not trying to be awful if I say to you, no, thank you. Because I've learned to not receive prayer from people that I don't know what's inside of them. Because I realise that you can impart good and impart evil. And, for instance, if you... Uh, there's an easy scripture, I don't know if I've got it down here, but Jesus said, uh, let the blind... a blind man can't lead... Uh, pull the blind man out of the pit. So if you've got a problem, how can you deliver somebody else from their problem? You've got a problem. Yeah. You get your act together. Sort it out. People are going around ministering and deliverance and doing all sorts of things. Oh, I can do this and that, but they're not right themselves. So all they're going to do is impart something evil. I mean, we go to churches where, or you probably go to churches to say, everybody lay hands on each other. If I said that here, everybody lay hands on each other. And... Uh, you don't know if the person next to you is a witch. You don't know if the person next to you is a prostitute or a male prostitute or whatever. But what I have, I give to you. So what are you doing? Yeah. You're receiving from them. What I have, I, Peter said, what I have, I give to you. Yeah. So it can be good or bad. And you wonder why sometimes you feel worse after somebody prayed for you. I wonder why you've never been truly healed. We've seen that with somebody in our church who's just been buried. She should have been healed. But she's not. Well, that's just another point. So, Mark 16, verse 15 says, And he said to them, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it by no means hurt them, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now remember, like I said, the disciples were doing it when Jesus was around. But when Jesus had gone to heaven, he said, stay in Jerusalem, because you can't do anything until the power not comes upon you. So those disciples that were casting out demons and healing the sick now suddenly can't do anything. Of course, the master had gone. But the master came back at Pentecost. Amen. And this is why Pentecost and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is most important. There's no church without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All you've got is a religious organisation of people or whatever. There's no church. And that's the most important thing. That's, that's what it's all about. Genesis 48, verse 14. Israel blessed. Israel was blessed. Sons of Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was a younger. And he stretched out his left hand, sorry, like that, on Manasseh's head, going his hands knowing for Manasseh was the firstborn. Now, they thought, well, no, Manasseh should have it. Not, not Ephraim. But he didn't. He changed his hands. God guided his hands. He thought it's, it's for him to have. Some people think, well, it's him to have. And you know... Many times I've travelled abroad, particularly in South America, where God, I've been praised God, has allowed me to minister. And I have to tell you this, I've seen more unbelievers healed than believers. The believers somehow feel as though they deserve the healing because I'm a Christian. I want to tell you, if that's you, you deserve nothing. Actually, yourself, you deserve hell. It's as simple as that. But if God desires to heal you, then he does do. But sometimes the people, unbelievers, they get healed. And I've seen it so many times, so many wonderful miracles, people who don't believe. But I tell you what, when they believe, <laughs> they see. I'll give you one. I was on the Amazon River. I went with a pastor on the Amazon. And we were coming back off the Amazon River. And we're walking down this little dirty arbor, and you've been there to Brazil, in Manaus. And uh, I said to the pastor, I said, Pastor, that lady who we just passed, she's blind. He said, well, yeah, maybe she is. I said, well, let's go and talk to her. And he said, oh, well, I can do that. I said, come on, let's go and talk to her. And I said, uh, Obviously, I had to use the uh, language. I said, I see you, see you blind. And he said, yeah. She said, I can't walk either. I'm waiting for a uh, boat to take her into the jungle where she lives. I said, well, I'm a Christian minister, and I believe Jesus heals. And I said, um, can I pray for you to be healed? And she said, yes. And I have to tell you, as soon as I put my hand on her shoulder, her eyes opened, and she could see. And she got up and started walking. And the pastor about fell back in the river. He said, I've never seen anything like it. I said, this is how the disciples did it. And I said to her, are you a Christian? She said, no, I'm a Catholic. And I said, well, let me tell you, my love, it wasn't Mary who healed you. It was Jesus. She said, yes, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. You know, we don't have to preach to them. We have to prove the gospel to them. We have to prove the gospel to them. If you can't prove it to them, what's the point preaching to them? If you're a believer, prove it. That's what it's meant to be. So well, this may be all new teaching for you. Well, it might get you rethinking. Well, <laughs> time you was rethinking then. Okay. So he blesses Ephraim, not Manasseh. And if you don't know, 
Ephraim is from the Gentiles, come from the tribe of Ephraim. So I am a, an, I am a Hebrew, a Gentile, it was a Gentile. I'm a Gentile Hebrew, of the tribe of Ephraim, even though I'm English. But you see, if you're born again and into that family on the tribe of Ephraim, and, and he was Hebrew, he was a Gentile, just like I think most of you are. Next scripture says, uh, where have we got to? I can't see where we got to on there. Turkey. Oh, oh, you moved it for me in. Thank you very much, Senator. I can't quite see it. I'm trying my eyes are not quite so good. Numbers 27, verse 23. Moses inaugurated Joshua to establish him in office. He laid his hands on him and inaugurated him just as the Lord commanded by the hands of Moses. So, through the laying on of hands, you could inaugurate somebody to be a pastor, a leader, or whatever. Right? And that's really uh, passing on the anointing uh, to, to minister. In Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, Joshua received the spirit of wisdom from Moses. Now, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of spirit of wisdom, for Moses had just uh, laid his hands on him, so the children of Israel heeded him and did, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. So you see, Moses laid his hands on Joshua. Now, Joshua had imparted this, uh, this blessing to him, where did it come from? It came from Moses. But some people think they can just put, play about with the Holy Spirit and just do it. You know, people have come to me and said, oh, pray for me to have the gift of wisdom or gift of prophecy or the gift of this. No, I said, no. I'll pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit for God to give you what he desires for you to have, not what you want. So many people see me moving in in the miracle ministry, and they've said, uh, we want the same as you. I said, I can't do it. God gave it me. I'll pay for you to get what you should get. Okay. 2 Kings 2, 12 to 13, Elijah. Elisha's mantle, you know, the prophet of gifting. You know, Elisha wanted Elijah's ministry. And... Uh, Elisha would not give it him. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his clothes and tore them into two pieces. Then he took up the mantle of Elisha to have fallen on him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. So what did he do? What did Elisha do? He got oxen. He got everything with his fathers. He destroyed the lot. I'm getting rid of everything, he said, to get that anointing. Well, maybe some do got to do that. Maybe some of you got to do that. Anything in your life that you put before God, you've got an idol. And God's saying to you, if you want my blessing, you've got to destroy it. Every single thing. And that's what he did. He got rid of everything, he slaughtered his cattle, and that before the anointing come upon him. Because the anointing is so special. It's the same anointing of Jesus. It's so special. People don't realise how special the Holy Spirit is. You just talk about it as though... It's, it's the Holy Ghost. It's the Spirit of Jesus that comes in you. It's not just a spirit, it's, it's a ghost. When I say that in Brazil, it's uh, fant Santa Fantasma, it freaks them out because it means a ghost. Well, actually, that's what it is. It's a ghost. I say, I've got a ghost inside of me. And then they go, weird. But well, that's what I've got, a ghost in me. It goes to Jesus. And I believe this, that's why I saw all those visions and everything I saw. Because it's, it's him. It's him. Mark 8, verse 23, the blind man. 
Jesus prayed twice, didn't he? he? So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and he put his hands on him, he said, if he saw anything, he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. And so you see, even Jesus, Trevor, if you got to go, I know you got to go early. I know you got to go early, but love you, glad you came. But I want to say that he had to, he had to pay twice. Even Jesus had to pay twice. And he had to take him out of the town. Why? Because there's unbelief in the town. How can you minister where there's unbelief? Notice in the scriptures, when Jesus went to raise people from the dead, he only took uh, two or three of his disciples. He didn't take the others. Why did he take the others? Because maybe they weren't like Peter, James and John. Well, today people say, well, I'm sorry you didn't tell me. Well, sorry, he couldn't trust them. The Bible says many believed in his name and saw his miracles, but he could not trust himself to them because he knew what was in them. And he, he knows what is inside each one of you and inside of me. He knows what's in you. So he made him look up. And he took him out of the town. And first of all, then he made him to prove to do something different that the miracle had happened. And often people think, so, well, David's a little bit uh, this and But if I pray and believe for a miracle, if it's in the wheelchair somewhere, I get out. Walk. If you're deaf, take out your aid. Mom came here for prayer, she got deaf. So I said, went to pray for her, I said, well, you've got an hearing aid in. She said, I oh, know, I've asked her to come to hear the hearing aid. Get rid of it. Then I'll pray for you. But you see, you've got to put your faith where it lies. If you've got any. Acts 8, verse 17. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. How did they receive the Holy Spirit? All through the New Testament, in every single area, they spoke in tongues. So it's a sign of the Holy Spirit. People say, well, I've got the Holy Spirit and uh, I don't speak in tongues. I would say, quite honestly, don't lie to me, you're lying to God. Because it's the power of the Holy Spirit that produces the tongues. And that's what it is. It's the power that produces it. So, whatever you think is, you've got to. I don't know what you've got to do. I know what I want you to do. What do you want to do? Acts 19, verse 6 the, the man called Priscilla and Aquila. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came to them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. There's another one, you see. So they were preaching the gospel, they're doing a good job. Priscilla and Quilla were very adequate in the scriptures and that, but they hadn't got the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, Look, I, I know what you're doing, but it's no good. You need something better. So listen to Paul, they laid hands on them and received the Holy Spirit. Now they'll, do, now they'll be able to preach. So Acts 13 verse 7, commissioning by the elders, by Paul and Saul. They, they fasted and prayed and they laid hands on them and they sent them away. Why? Because they, the elders laid hands on Paul and, uh, and Barnabas and sent them out. That was the anointed. Acts 3, verse 6, Peter and John. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. So, you see, what I have I give to you. Well, if you've got something else inside of you, you're going to give them that as well. And I can remember I was ministering once uh, in my time, I've done some things obviously and made mistakes as a, a Christian and uh, which we do do but I've learned from that now but I can remember that I was ministering in a town called Finchley in London some of you are from London eh? I don't know but Finchley at a full gospel dinner and I missed it at night and many people were coming up and they've been slain in the spirit and being touched and healed and everything and uh, some people thought I was 
a, a couple, for some reason, said, oh, you must be running weak. Let us come and pray for you. So I said, no, I don't need your prayers, thank you. Go back and sit down. I feel absolutely fine. So they kept coming up while I missed it. I said, I said go away, I'm, I'm all right, I'm okay. I'm praying for these people. So they kept doing it, and right at the very end, they said, can we pray for you now? You know, so we try to be kind sometimes to people, don't we? Rather than just tell them where to go. So I said, oh, go on, you can pray for me now. So I let them pray for me. Anyway, I went to this house to stay, and it was a lovely house. I've never slept in such a comfy bed and comfy pillows and everything. And do you know, I didn't have a wink of sleep all night long. I was going round and round and round and round. And I couldn't wait to have breakfast and come home. And I got back to my wife. I said, Helen, somebody prayed for me last night. And I don't know, there's something wrong with it. I want you to cut me free from these people and drive that thing out, whatever they put in me. And she did, she prayed and broke any curse that they put on my life. She said, I'll make you a cup of tea, but I never had a cup of tea, I was fast asleep on the settee. But you see, people just think they can do this. You can't do this. You're going to do what God says. We've got to do what God says. Just because he said you're down on the sick and recover and do all this and the other, he's talking about the people who are baptised in the Holy Ghost. That you've got rid of your sin and everything, of course. 1 Timothy 5 verse 22 said, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. So there's two aspects of laying on the hands. Notice it says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in the people's sins, but keep yourself pure. So what are they doing? You're sharing in their sins. You're sharing in their sins. And they think they can do that. Of course, oh, I'm a Christian, I accepted Jesus, and now they done. Sorry, you've got to get right. You've got to be right before God. Your life has to be totally laid out before God. We used to play, before I was a Christian, we used to play uh, uh, with friends. We used to play uh, something called solo. Anybody play solo? Anybody know what solo is? Well, you play cards like a, a whist type of cards. And uh, you have to lay, or, and if you want the top to get the uh, top all 13 all 13 tricks. You have to lay your cards out on the table for everybody to see. And say, I'm going to get none. But if you get one, win one, one card trick, then you're lost. So you lay it all out. And that's what it's like. Laying your whole life out before God. And let him see everything that's inside of you. And you'll, you'll probably realise that something's wrong. I was only thinking coming here that there's so much uh, problem at the moment with children that are um, being um, uh, trying to change transgender and uh, things like this. And there's got NHS problem. You've seen it on the news and one thing or another. All this. I just want to ask them to one question. Just answer one question, and I'll tell you where the problem is. The children of transgender want to change transgender? I said, just answer one question to me. Your mother and your father. To the man, I say, how many people you had sex with? And to the woman, how many people you had sex with in your life? Then you'll find out why the child is transgender. I've got a teaching about it, it's absolutely great teaching, it's called Who Am I? I might teach it next time. I'll probably bring it up to uh, when I teach in uh, um, the place I'm doing it in Blackpool. Transgender. Why are there transgender? Why are so many? It's pretty obvious. How many people you had sex with? Because you joined to every single one of them. That means not the men, you don't only join to the women. 
but you join to the men that they've had sex with. And the women on the same side, you join to them that they've had sex with. So you join to all the men, and all the women, and all the men, and all the women, and now you've got a child and they don't know what it is. That's the answer to reason the transgender. The child doesn't know what it is. And it's true, they're being born like it. God not made, God's not made them like it. Sin has made them like it. And it's the parents. But they don't ask the parents, do they? No. Now, if the parents were absolutely honest, if the parents got deliverance from every single man and woman that had been involved in, and they did and they did, and then before they get married, then you'll probably find out they might have a pure child. But there's your problem. You've got to be honest. Sometimes you won't even share, but you've got to be honest. Because the Bible said, when two become together, become one. So you become one with them. Anyway, that's another teaching. I'm just sharing this with you. So, keep yourself pure. 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. Gifts was imparted by Paul to stir it up. Therefore I mind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you from the laying on of my hands. So through the laying on of hands there can be a gift laid on, if you're right. So now it said stir it up. In other words, use it. Use the gift. The gift is not meant to be there to lay dormant. If you've got a gift of prophecy, then prophesy. If you've got a gift of knowledge, then use it. Don't let it die dormant. What's the point of God giving you a gift if you ain't going to use it? What's the point of having a, a Christmas, somebody buy you a Christmas present, a bike or something, and say, well, I've got a lovely bike for Christmas, but I never wrote it. Never wrote it. <laughs> well, you waste time giving you that gift then, won't it? You meant to use the gift if God has given you a gift. James 5, 14 to 15, is there anyone who runs sick? I think he intuits on this a little bit. Let them call the elders of the church that they should pray over them, anointing him with all in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will forgive them. It didn't say anybody lands on you, did it? What does it say? The elders of the church, the ones that are supposed to have the Holy Ghost. That's what it says. Well, we can't change the word of God. Let him call the elders of the church to pray over him and his sick. I made a couple of notes here. I've already touched on this one in Finch, there's a couple, and uh, I was in London. At a meeting in somebody's house, and there was a lady with a, a strong spirit of Jezebel, and uh, another woman with a Jezebelic spirit, but it was weaker. And do you know, while we were talking, this strong spirit took over this lady and she was dumb, she couldn't do nothing, she couldn't say anything. She didn't come back to her own mind until we're halfway back up to the motorway. Why? Because this strong spirit that was in this woman had took over her, controlled her spirit. I was in the USA, I went to a church, a big church, and when I got there, there was only one person in the church. I said, well, where's all the people? There were a load of people out on the street. I said, but there's only one person in the church, a young lad. So I said, where are they all? Anyway, about to start and everybody came in. But they'd all been out smoking. And I said to the pastor, I said, you've all been outside smoking. He said, yeah, I've been smoking as well. I said, you're smoking, now the old church is smoking. They've all got your demon that you've got. See, it went right through the old church. The first person who got to set free from it was the pastor, and then the elder, and then the rest of the church. And they set them all free from it. They all got the cigarettes on the floor, we smashed them to bits. All of them and threw, everything away, threw the lighters away and threw everything away. And they got set free. But you see, you know, you say I want to pack up smoking, you, see, you, you go back to your car and you know you've got some cigarettes in your car. Because the first thing you're going to do is go open it up and have a drink. <laughs> Who are you kidding? You're trying to kick God? 
another church we're involved in, the pastor is involved in adultery and it spread through the church. Everybody would feast up having sex. Why? Because it was in church. In the pastor. In Mark 1, verse 21 to 28, it said the first miracle Jesus did. Then he went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And then they were all amazed, so they were questioning amongst themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For even with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout this entire region around Galilee. So, we see here, Jesus went to the synagogue, and that's where they start a church, isn't it? Synagogue, worshiping God. And But there was a man with an unclean spirit said, what are you to do with us? Now, Jesus cast out the demon out of the man, but notice it says, us. That means more than one. That means plural. That means there must have been many in there. But he only cast the one out who came to him. You see, birds of a feather flock together. Those who like a certain type of teaching, teaching I should say, will go to that sort of church. Uh, 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 excuse a quick, but those who want, like water will probably go to a Baptist church. Those who like uh, liturgy and, and being uh, religious will probably go to an Anglican church uh, or whatever. Do you understand what I'm saying? People flock, birds of a feather, they flock together. Because that's why you've got so many different churches. People say to me, what are you, David? Are you a Christian? Are you, are you a Baptist, a Catholic? A, uh, what, what are you? I said, no, I'm an RC. Oh, you're Roman Catholic. I said, no, real Christian. <laughs> I'm neither of them. I <laughs> won't be any. If I label myself as a Pentecostal, then I'm put a label on myself and I'm not going past that. Yeah. The Pentecostal churches, they're against deliverance ministry. Yeah. I went to a Pentecostal church up north a while back, and it's supposed to be a Pentecostal church, all they wanted to be do was produce miracles. When I was talking about deliverance, they thought of a, a court or something, and uh, they don't want to do it. Why did they start a church here? Because I know all the rest of the churches in the town do not believe. And you won't find many churches that move like it does in this church, or like I do. Because all over the country, all over this country, they're not. And so it's so difficult to get into ministry somewhere. I'm going to do a conference in, in uh, uh, Blackpool. And you know where we've had to get a place to get? And that's all the churches that said no. Do you know where we've had to use? We've had to use a witchcraft place, a scout movement to get in. Check out the scout movement, it's exactly the same as masonry. Got much teachings on it. And, and the guides as well. But we'll do some praying in the place before it happens. But what I'm saying is, when it's just the church, they don't want to know. You've got to go and do something else. Somewhere else to do something. That's the state of the church in England. Yeah. The state of the church in England. Quite honestly, to me, it's disgusting. Yeah. Anyway, Jesus set the man free, and the only one who came to him. Again, a pastor only teaches on prosperity. Why does he do that? Because he's, he's got a love of money. All he wants is money, yeah. riches. Yes. And the Bible said, may your riches take you to hell. God's not interested in the money. We all need it. We all need it to do whatever God to do. But if you put money before God, you've got a big problem. Yeah. Right. Yet Malachi teaches us we should tithe and give. 
Now, when I was in the full gospel, they were very good at tithing. They said about when you tithe, you've got to make sure, are you really tithing? People say, I'm giving so much of money. But what about the interest in your bank account? What about your interest in your share account? What about this? What about this? What about this? Are you tithing 10% of everything? Come write down everything you've got and then we'll find out if you're really tithing. That's what they said. So you see, people not really telling the truth. They're telling lies. And God hates a liar. Toronto, I'm switched on this, in Deuteronomy. Next one in. Remember when that Toronto spirit came about? There was a man called Todd Bentley, went laying hands on everybody, and he had the meetings in England. I think you were much part of it. It came to a church where you were in Arrogant, didn't you? Yeah, I wasn't part of it. Thank no, but, no, but you was in that church. And uh, my daughter rang me up and said, what should I do, David? I said, get out of the church. What should I do, David? I said, get out. Yeah. And he went there, and... Uh, the church paid for him £12,000, you put me right if I'm wrong, for him to come over. And he had a collection every single night for him. And the church said, we want a real big collection this, this night because, you know, it's cost us so much money to have this man here. So the collection on the last night will go to the church. And then Todd Bente went up the front, I believe it's quite true. And he said, the pastor's wrong, all the money's coming to me tonight. And here's the man. He had these tattoos, a lot of these tattoos, in England. And every one of them, as you could see, is a demon. Yeah. And he's laying hands on people. He's laying hands on people. Mm. What I have, I give to you. <laughs> yeah. Why are Christians so gullible? Next one, Ian. There again. When he started ministering, he hadn't got any. I'm not doing it for a man. I'm having to show you this to show you the pictures. I'm not calling the man in it, not a man as a person, but I'm showing you the type of thing. In every tattoo, there's a demon. You've got a tattoo you need pain for. These people are laying hands on people. Demonic signs and sublivial messages tacked on the evangelist picturesque. There's quite a lot about it there. We've got some more pictures, but we're not doing any more. Carry on here. And the scripture says they all went over to Toronto. Everybody of England, all the churches more or less went over. But scripture says in Deuteronomy, let me find the scripture, Deuteronomy 31. Nor it is beyond the sea that you should say it will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. So people are flooding over to receive this sort of new gift, the same. And people are all flooded over to there to get it. And they say, you've got to come and receive it to pass it on to your church. Well, that's exactly what they've done all over England. Yeah. Passed it on and now we'll bring it that way. But the scripture says, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we hear it and do it? Isn't the Holy Spirit everywhere? Isn't Jesus the omnipotent God everywhere? You see, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, he didn't leave part of himself in heaven. He came in, in all his fullness. We used to have a song, we used to sing a song in this church and say you can throw that one away. We're never going to sing that again. And it says something like, Oh God of burning, cleansing flames, send the fire. If you didn't know that one? And what they say, we need another Pentecost. So, so what, isn't the first Pentecost good enough? Wasn't Jesus good enough? What are you saying? That God is not good enough? You'll be careful what you sing. False anointings. 
But you have an anointing from the Holy One, you know all things. I am not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lies in the truth. But the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, is not a lie, and just as taught you, you will abide in him. See, I've not got it in now, but the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, but many of you receive another Jesus or another spirit or another gospel. Another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And uh, I played with a man once who was a leader, a uh, worship leader in this church or the other church I was, and uh, I realized he got a problem and he got a false Jesus. And I cast the demon out of him and it named itself Jesus of Nazareth. I cast it out of him. Well, it left with a violent thing, and I commanded that Jesus of Nazareth, spirit, come out! Because he got a false Jesus. Many people have died named Jesus, and many people died in Nazareth named Jesus. If you go to Spain, there are half the people in Spain named Jesus. Well, there's only one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, from Nazareth, the Son of God. Only one. Only one. And many people have got wrong Jesuses. And I wonder why there's no anointing, no power. Laying hands on people. Oh, yeah, here's another one. Let's see if I've got time. I was ministering to a lady once who got Freemasonry spirits. And we were dealing with all these spirits in, in our lounge and the lady come for prayer and a lad came and, uh, and uh, I'd prayed with him a week before and I thought he was perfectly all right. So I said, oh, well, you come in here and you can help us minister. My wife was with me. And I said, just put your hand under this lady's feet and she's on the floor. We could drive the demons up out of the body. And uh, suddenly everything stopped. No more ministry. So we stopped the ministry, and I couldn't understand it. The more they stopped. Anyway, um, next day, the lad rang me up. I said, the Pastor David, you can come and see me. So I said, what's the problem? He said, my face is in a voice. and he can't move my hand, he can't move my legs. So I went over, he's from Tamworth, and went over to find out, and only found out that his grandfather was a Freemason. So what was happening? He still got that spirit in him which we thought he would deliver us from it, but rather than the demons coming out of the lady, they were going into him. Yeah. Transfer the spirits. Transfer the spirit. I could give you many. I've got many other testimonies, but I'm not going to give you more now. <sighs> a lady in a spirit of grief. Youth is in sin. We have seen people... A youth who was full of sin and sort of problems, he got set free and uh, wonderfully set free and went back to the local church. I won't go to tell you because it's in this town, not too far from here. And they said, that's called doctrines of demons. You're a Christian, you can't have a demon. So they told him to renounce all the ministry. Well, that then now, I've not seen him for a few years, but last time I heard of him, he's an homosexual, and he got tattoos all over his body, and he's on drugs. But that's what the church did to him. You see, you go to church, another lad once went to a church. Every Sunday he went to a certain church, and every Monday he was down my house. Every time he went in this church, he got demonized by just entering the building. And when he come down to my house, next to be set free. And this is happening every week. So I said, I'm not going to do it no more. I've told you what you've got to do. But you won't listen. Mm. You see, as a pastor and a man of God, I told people what they're going to do, but they don't do it. I'm no time for them people. If they don't do it, I'm ready to wash my hands off them. I do it. Come for me for direction and truth. If you don't do it, you're rebellious. It's as simple as that. Well, I said to this lad, I'm not going to pray for you no more. And I didn't do. I said, why do you go to that church? He said, my wife goes there and the children are right to go. I said, well, 
Why? Is the church about taking your kids? Teach your kids at home. If you can't find a church. Why? Just because you want to go? And when you know it's wrong? Why do you support something which is wrong? You know, it's like, it, it's, it's like, isn't it? It's like, it's like um, going to Asda to get all your food and pay your bill to Aldi. <laughs> Why do you support something which is wrong? Where are you? There's one more in, isn't there? I want you to see that picture. This is the last one I'm going to talk about. A few years ago, I went to Haiti. Haiti is one of the most evil places in the world. You can see all the problems in Haiti now, can't you? The, the, home, the, the religion is Satanism. And we went over there, taking Bibles there, and we couldn't find anything that was remotely Christian. And some of the guys who were with me got mixed up in all sorts of things. Anyway, uh, I didn't want to do it. Uh, but while we were there, one of the lads said, the only place we could see was this big church. I didn't know what it was, but I come to realize it was a Catholic church. And Peter was singing all the songs that you would sing here. And uh, ladies got Jesus with a few stickers in the neck. And the people think, oh, I saw this. Jesus with a sticker on them and things like this and things like that. Oh, this seems to be all right. And because I was with these others and we, it was so depressing place, I thought, oh, well, this will find somewhere. So we went there. And one of the lads said, uh, we... Uh, uh, I used to be a Catholic. I said, let's go and have, take communion. And uh, so I, I went with them. And I'm telling this now because it's telling my weaknesses so you don't fall into this. Do you understand me? So you don't fall into this. I would never normally do it in England, but because we were there, I did it. Anyway, it didn't affect me too much even though it affected the others. But then I came back to England and somebody asked me to go and minister to some of these witches who were down, down in Cheltenham. So I started to pray for this lady who was, said, this said she'd come out of witchcraft. So I laid hands on her and nobody else laid hands on her but nothing happened. When I, I laid hands on her, she fell out of the chair on the floor. And uh, she got up and I said, are you all right? She didn't speak. I looked at her, I said, are you all right? She didn't speak. I said, oh, we'll, we'll all go then. Got in the car. And while we were in the car coming back, I started coming over weird. And Ian was at my home in Helen. Helen. I started over coming over weird. And my head was going round all over the place. I tried to go to bed at night and all I could see was witches' brooms and things like this. And uh, I didn't know what was happening to me. I felt absolutely weird. I didn't know that he and Helen took me to see a doctor. I didn't know that. And I didn't know the next day I'd go and see my own doctor and he said, you're going straight to the mental asylum. And I finished up a fortnight in the mental asylum. And if my friend Dougie had to pray for me day and night and fasted day and night, I don't know what happened to me. But you know, they gave me drugs and things like that and you do come round eventually. And then I didn't understand really to totally until a lady in our church gave me a book that she'd bought and it showed the court and all the witchcraft and the voodoo. And there's the picture that was in the book. in Port-au-Prince, same, same uh, Catholic church that I went to. You see, voodoo and Satanism and Catholics in 80 is exactly the same. They are one. And I took communion there. So that made me one with when. But do you say? One bread, one body, we all one body. What am I doing? I'm joining myself to them. And so many people are joining themselves to the wrong things by communion. The thing says it's all right, but you don't know. The Bible said get yourself right before you take communion. 
So when you're taking communion, pastor, and pastor, stand up, pastor. I want you to my lovely friend, pastor from London. Yes, we've got another pastor here from, uh, well, I don't know where you're living now, but uh, you were from London, weren't you? And you were his pastor, weren't you? Yeah, well, you've got to do some work with him, haven't you? <laughs> anyway, so, what I'm saying is, you take communion, you're joining yourself to each other. Because we are one, but what did say? Well, let me read it to you, so you know. I'll read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you've never read the scriptures. Ten verse say sixteen. For the cup and the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we there are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So we all together. We all together. And you're taking communion. So you join yourself to those. But you just do it because they say it. You need to read the scriptures. For it says, what's the same? Is an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or are we going to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than him? And the scripture says in the other one, 1 Corinthians 11, this is why many of you are sick and many of you drop dead. Because you've taken it in the wrong manner. Because you don't know what you're doing. Well, I want to say that Jesus brought me out of this and made me stronger but I'm telling you that that's what happened to me hallelujah well you've got a lot of questions I realise that you can make out questions afterwards but you see a lot of questions now I'm going to have, we're going to have some lovely lunch in a minute but is there anything on there which I've said today you know that David you're speaking to me raise your hand come and stand here then Come on, stand here. Those who raise the hand. So, whatever it is you need to renounce, okay? I've got to, I've got to, uh, um, my nan said to me. Pardon? My nan, when I was a little boy, I just remembered when you were speaking. Yeah. She put her hand on me. She went, I've got really bad nerves. You're just like me. You're going to have bad nerves all your life. Well, she cursed you, didn't she? Well, I have. I've had, I've had nervous breakdowns. I've got yeah. mental health diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. You, so you've got, got my curse, yeah. Like you see, just like I said the other day to somebody, yeah. the lady came for prayer, she was so upset because she'd, she, she got nobody, she got no man. She, uh, uh, um, her mother said, I want you to, before, before she died, I want you to look after your brothers. Mm. And that's what she did. Mm. Right? But what's happening, that lady, because she told her that, is still alive, living through them. Yeah, my mate's dead, Doris. You know, I've learned a scripture while I've been off, and it says, wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Mm. Wherever there's something dying or something weak, the vultures will come and take a picking. Take a picking, take a picking, take a picking. And the fact of it is that through that, there's a problem. And many people, uh, got dead people living in them, but they're still living out their life, mm. right? Even though they're dead. Yeah, I'll get that, yeah. So, you stand up, say. Standing up. Yeah, put your feet to one, one side, don't be. Just stand up, say. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
I cut this man free from his grandma and every curse she put on him and I break it and I break it. I command to loose him in Jesus' name. Loose him. Come out of him. Come out of him. Open your mouth. Go in Jesus' name. Open your mouth. Let it go. Let it go in Jesus' name. Come on out. Every spirit of witchcraft, come out in Jesus' name. Every spirit of a dead person, come out of this man. Every spirit of a dead person and leave. Leave now. Open your mouth. Let it go. Let it go. Every spirit of grandma, let it go. Let it go. Grandma, leave this man in Jesus' name. Take your curses with you. No longer will you have this illnesses in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stay there. Open your mouth. Don't wake us people here. Just let it go. Let it go. What's on you, my friend? You reminded me when you spoke about spiritual transference. Yeah. My wife died of dementia. Yeah. At home. When I got up and I went into the room where she was... Switch off it. Switch off, Richard. When I went 